Welcome back acolytes to the channel. Similar to our video compilation on the ancient Sith, we decided to put together all of our lore videos surrounding the ancient Jedi to give you guys a longer format video. A video that you can relax to, study to, or really anything, but basically a longer form content with all of the compilation of the lore that we have put together in one spot or at least a lot of the pieces of major Star Wars Ancient Jedi lore. Our information and lore on the Ancient Jedi surprisingly isn't quite as in-depth as it is on the Ancient Sith, which is why I wanted to pick the best key stories about the Ancient Jedi and their various philosophies, and put together this video that really highlights what the Ancient Order was like. So without further ado guys, I hope you enjoyed this video that we compiled about all of the information and all of the separate videos that we've made about the Ancient Recently, Jedi Order the failings and shortcomings of the Jedi Order around the time of the Clone Wars and how that impacted their stay in the galaxy at large. Since we were pretty harsh to them in that video, I thought we'd turn the clock back to a time when they weren't all politics. When viewing a timeline of Star Wars, it would seem as though the Jedi had been around forever, always watching and protecting the galaxy, but like everything else, they too had their beginnings and their dawn. So grab a snack and stick with us today as we'll tell you the story of the ancient Jedi Order. Our story begins a very long time ago, in the year 36,453 BBY. The Tho-Yor-8 Great Pyramid ships that were scattered across the galaxy began to call out to inhabitants of planets that they were located on, including Ando Prime, Kashyyyk, Manan, Ryloth, and Dathomir. Through the Force, the Thoyor convinced the Force-sensitive sentients around them to board their starships, and the pyramid ships then departed the planets upon which they had sat for so long, and set out into the deep galaxy. The Thoyor ships then traversed the galaxy, gathering Force-sensitives of many cultures and species, so that by the time that the eight ships joined and journeyed into the Deep Core together, the eight Thoyor traveled into the Deep Core to the planet known as Tython with all manner of force sensitives aboard their ships, all trusting the mysterious pyramid-shaped starcrafts. Upon arriving to the planet of Tython, there was a ninth, far larger Thoyor that awaited them as it floated above a pinnacle of stone. The arrival of the Thoyor was heralded by an immense force storm that swept over the entire planet, and the eight ships gathered around the ninth largest before scattering across the planet in an event that would become known as the First Migration. In fact, the first dating system before BBY was TYA, which meant though your arrival. This event saw each ship deposit their passengers at the final destination and remain there, with some of these ships burying themselves in the landscape while others remained floating in the sky. The four sensitive pilgrims immediately realized that Tython was uniquely strong in the Force, and the pilgrims, known collectively as the Tythons, soon realized that they had been brought to Tython in order to study the Force and learn to control and master the abilities it granted them. However, Tython's beauty came with dangers, and the pilgrims' lives became a constant form of moving meditation on the Force, truly learning from it and living through it. Rather than sitting in silent meditation, the pilgrims also realized that Tython itself reflected violence with four storms and quakes to imbalance between the light and the dark side of the Force, and the staunch binary between the two. The Tythons named each of these respective sides Ashla and Bogan after Tython's two moons, the bright satellite celestial being Ashla and the Dark Moon of Bogan. The pilgrims therefore formed the Jedi Order and took their name of language of the Dai Bendu monks and the Talid species, combining the words Je, meaning mystic, and Dai, meaning center. The philosophy of balance became essential to survival on Tython, as harmony and balance between Ashla and Bogan maintained the peaceful beauty of Tython and prevented the chaos and destruction that came with imbalance. Over the next thousand years, the Jedi built the Jedi temples, cities, and centers of learning and healing that each centered around one of the Tho Yor. Early in the Jedi Order's history, the Order established their nine Jedi temples around the nine Tho Yor across the planet with each ship holding great significance and a place of holy worship. While other cities and settlements were later built on the planet, the Nine Temples were home to most of the planet's inhabitants and were the seats of the Order's presence upon Tython. Akar Kesh, the Temple of Balance, was considered to be the most sacred of all, and it was built within the Great Pinnacle of Stone, above which the largest Tho Yor hovered. The Temple of Science, Anil Kesh, straddled the planetary rift known as the Chasm near its floating Tho Yor, and its inhabitants meddled in science and alchemy. The Temple of Healing, Maharakesh, was located in the deep ocean, and the Temple of the Arts, 
Bodhi was located on the plains of the continent of Masara. Back in this day, the Jedi practiced the Force freely, experiencing both sides in perfect harmony. There was very little restriction placed on the exploration of the dark side, or at the time known as Bogan, so long as students explored it in moderation. In Jedi philosophy, they acknowledged the fact that there was always light within darkness, and darkness within light, therefore meaning that it was impossible for one to ever be truly free of the other. Unlike the later Jedi Order, the Jedi were encouraged to give in to the temptations of both the light as well as the dark, as they believed it was necessary to embrace both in order to learn more about the Force. The Jedi viewed living on Titan as a near constant meditation state and study of the Force, and the Great Journey was intended to oppose young journeyers to the various disciplines and arts that were studied at each temple. Even their code at the time reflected this. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no fear, there is power. I am the heart of the Force. I am the revealing fire of light. I am the mystery of darkness, in balance with chaos as well as harmony, immortal in the Force. Since they believed that all aspects of the Force were a part of one living Force, they actually did indulge in alchemy. Long before this practice was purely corrupted by the dark side into Sith alchemy, the Jedi had students that would specialize in alchemy, and from this came their signature weapons of the era. Before the lightsabers, they had regular Durasteel swords. But of course, these swords were anything but normal. Using alchemy, they forged these steel swords to be imbued with the force itself. Once the blade had been forged, an initiate would place a crystal into the hilt of the blade, and then would marry the lattices of the crystal and the blade together. This was accomplished by submerging oneself deep into a trance granted by the force, and then meditating on the blade and crystal until blade, crystal, and smith became as one. Once the latices were married, the wielder would channel energy through the crystal and into the blade until it began to glow with a nimbus of energy, signifying that the blade had been permanently infused with the force. It is unclear whether the crystal they used in this way were kyber crystals that we know and are familiar with now in Star Wars lore, but suffice it to say, if it could channel the force, it was most likely a kyber crystal. Now though, what did the Jedi Order actually do with all of this information that they managed to garner? Much like the modern Jedi, they did travel off-world to help systems in need. The predecessors of the Jedi Knight was the Jedi Ranger. Rangers were deployed by the Jedi Council and across Titan's system, fulfilling assignments and missions requested by the Council or the other settled worlds. Rangers wore a badge known as the Ranger Star to signify their rank, and they were given their choice of starship, either a Hunter-class Starfighter or the larger Peacemaker-class Cruiser. Rangers were tasked with the missions of diplomacy, tracking fugitives, ending conflicts, and a wide variety of other missions, and some rangers rarely returned to Titan. If a Jedi ranger had shown sufficient experience, wisdom, and understanding of the Force, they might be promoted to the rank of Jedi Master which was the highest rank a Jedi could achieve other than a Temple Master. Despite the services the Order provided to other nearby settled worlds, the existence of the Jedi in their isolation world of Titan became a thing of legend. It wasn't until the reign of Queen Hydea of Shikakwa that a full-blown conflict erupted between the Order and non-Force sensitives that shared the star system in a system-wide conflict known as the Despot War. Queen Hydea led her army against Titan in a series of campaigns in 25,805 BBY. Despite massive casualties on both sides, the Jedi Order was able to vanquish Hydea and her forces and return the balance to the world of Titan. While balance was indeed restored, turmoil festered on Titan just 12 years later, when the Jedi Order found the wreckage of the first ship to enter the system since the Tho Yor brought their ancestors to the world. The ship of unknown origin crashed on Titan in the area known as the Rift, close to the Temple of Anil Kresh, and the mass death sparked a force storm of proportions not seen since the arrival of the Tho Yor. Representatives of the Order investigated the crash and encountered the sole survivor, a mysterious man named Kesh, who carried a bizarre weapon known as a Force Saber. The Force Saber was a Rakatan invention in which powerful dark side energy was channeled through laboratory grown crystals and glowing energy blades, able to be ignited as if it was a regular lightsaber. However, because of its ties to the dark side, any Jedi were at risk of succumbing with each and every use of the Force Saber, even though a lot of them were highly intrigued by its existence, and the existence of a dark side wielder from off-world. This, though, would not be the last of them. 
During the Rakatan invasion of the Titan system, the Jedi Order showed signs of a great divide between those who wished to use the Force Saber and those who wished to not to. The Force Saber could be considered the catalyst of the great divide between the light and the dark side of the Force, a divide that would eventually result in the creation of the Jedi as well as the Sith. Eventually, history would play out as we know it today, with the Jedi rebranding themselves as the Jedi, opting to root themselves entirely in the light, and going to war with the Dark Jedi during the Great Schisms. Therefore, the Great and Powerful Jedi Order and the origin of the Jedi, as well as the Sith, coming to an official end. So friends, what do you think of the Ancient Order? Do you believe they had it figured out? What do you think the galaxy would be like if the Jedi had stayed in these ways rather than deviating into the dogma and tradition that we know today? A strict binary of light and dark. Tell us your thoughts, and as always, may Ashla and Bogan be with you, and have a great day. The Jedi are commonly regarded as peaceful protectors of the galaxy, specifically the innocence of the galaxy. It is because of this that it is unlike their nature to actually go out with the intention of exterminating an entire species. The species must be special in itself, as again, this would be an exceptionally rare occurrence. There is one species in Star Wars, however, so dangerous that the Jedi had to band together in order to eliminate them. A species with mysterious origins, but deep ties to the dark dark side of the force. This creature is known as a Tarentatech. Before we explore the bloody history of the Tarentatech, I want to remind you guys about the big sale on the Star Wars merch page which is coming to a close very soon. Because the second season of The Mandalorian isn't out yet, everything on the Star Wars merch page is significantly discounted, where now you can get t-shirts and hoodies up to 70% off and as low as $15. So if you like anything you see here on screen, be sure to check it out in the description down below. It should be the top link. Grab it now while the sale continues as it will not last forever. Now, let's get into the history of a Tarentatech. It should be stated first that most of what we know about a Tarentatech comes from Star Wars Legends. However, they are canon, as it is believed that both Dooku and Yoda fought a Tarentatech on Kashyyyk, with Dooku saying this to his master, I was telling them the tale of when you faced the giant Tarentatech on Kashyyyk. What a terrible beast it was. The history of a Tarentatech in Star Wars canon is not nearly as layered as it is in Legends. However, it does say this. Tarentatechs hunted individuals sensitive to the Force in order to feed on their blood. Using their highly poisonous tusks and claws in combat, they were known for their viciousness. According to Count Dooku, however, they were not very intelligent. Tarentatex came from the forest floors of the planet of Kashi. Some individuals believe that the Tarentatex derived from rancors transformed by the dark side of the force, or that they were simply a result of some experiment by the Sith. What was clear is that a Tarentatex did have a connection to the force, however, they were not able to wield it. What was clear though was that they fed on the blood of force sensitives, and even showed some resistance to the force itself making them exceptionally dangerous for a Jedi or even a Sith. A Tarentatech also showed a clear allegiance to the dark side of the Force, meaning that they likely could be controlled by some powerful Sith master as they were in Legends. Now let's jump over to the Legends explanation of the Tarentatech, a creature so dangerous that the Jedi Order resolved to destroy them completely. This is what it says about a Tarentatech under the Legends Wikipedia explanation. Tarentatechs resembled rancors, although smaller, approximately one-fourth the size of a fully grown bull rancor, except they had a number of spines growing from their backs and a pair of flaps, or tusk-like projections attached to their mouths. They also had massive claws, four to a hand. The tusks and claws of a Tarentatech were highly venomous. It was theorized that they were once rancors subjected to mutations by the Sith. And when the dark side was weak in the galaxy, Tarentatechs would hibernate and remain dormant for many years only to return when the dark side was strong yet again. The largest Tarentatech ever found was in the tomb of the Sith Lord Naga Sadao, as it was assigned to guard it. This Tarentatech was known as a Mauler, and is the only one known of its species, meaning that in life it was likely specifically designed by Naga Sadao to protect his tomb upon his death. In Legends, the Tarentatech can also be found on the Sith homeworld of Korriban, although they are still most prominently found on the planet of Kashyyyk. This leads me to believe that the ancient Sith experimented them on Kashyyyk as they did not want them to run rampant on their home world, but would later bring some over. If you delve deep into Legends lore, we can actually discover the true origins of a Tarentatech. 
and it's revealed that they were not actually created by the Sith, but the ancient Jedi Order known as the Jedi. The first prototype of what would become the fearsome Tarentatex was first seen on the planet of Tython, the home world of the Jedi Order, centuries before the rise of the Republic or the uniting of the Jedi in the Republic itself. It was here that a Tarentatex would be created for the first time, when a Jedi Master attempted to use the Force in order to create a creature that could sense explosives. Unfortunately for him though, he alchemically created the first Tarentatex, known as a Tarenta. The Tarentatex eventually developed a taste for Force-sensitive enriched meat, and thus began targeting Force users. At some point, they were disposed of on Tython's moon of Bogan, where they prowled the surface. Bogan being the moon that represented the dark side of the Force in early Jedi tradition. Many believe that then a Tarentatex found its way somehow to the planet of Korriban, where it was able to evolve even further, thanks to the massive source of dark side energies present on the planet. Exar Kun is also a Sith Lord that apparently used his powers to create Tarentatex, one of the first Sith Lords ever to do so. Among the Jedi, a Tarentatex was considered the most dangerous creature bred by the Sith, and they were often dubbed Jedi Killers, with Exar Kun using the monsters to destroy Jedi outposts on both Tatooine, Kashyyyk, and Tython, not having to lift a finger, but simply deploying his monsters. During an event known as the Great Hunt, numerous Jedi traveled throughout the galaxy to try and exterminate the Tarentatex. Jedi were often sent in groups of two or three to battle the beasts, and the Jedi of the group had a strong force bond between them. This was done so that the group could strengthen than itself from the dark influence prevalent in the layers of the Tarentatex. Even the Tarentatex's very dwellings were dangerous. The Jedi also had to rely almost exclusively on their weaponry skills alone due to the almost complete force immunity of the Tarentatex, meaning that only the best lightsaber wielders were sent to hunt down the creatures. None of the hunts were completely successful, however, even though the Jedi seemingly exterminated the majority of the Tarentatex each and every time. The waxing of the dark side would trigger the Tarentatex to come out of hibernation and to repopulate the galaxy. Such events included the rise of power of Revan and Malak, and even Emperor Palpatine, where once Palpatine took control of the galaxy, more Tarentatex were starting to pop up yet again, a problem that Luke Skywalker would face. But that was the history of the Tarentatex, again what the ancient Jedi considered to be the most dangerous creature ever created by the Sith, and one of the few species that the Jedi resolved to completely destroy and wipe out, even though they were never successful. But now I would love to hear your thoughts on this alien species. What are your thoughts on the Tarentatex, and had you heard of them prior to this video? As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching. May the Force be with you, and have a great day. The philosophy of the Jedi Order changed a great deal over the centuries of their existence. The Jedi that we know are protectors and guardians of the universe. Their main goal is to maintain order throughout the galaxy. These Jedi strictly follow and adhere to the light side of the Force and the light side of the Force only, neglecting the dark entirely. So much so that so many Jedi even failed to acknowledge the dark side at all, something that ultimately led to the Jedi's downfall during the Clone Wars conflict. But the philosophy of the ancient Jedi order was far different than this. The ancient Jedi spoke of balance, a harmony between the light and the dark aspects of the Force. These Jedi were far more focused on progressing themselves mentally and physically than the galaxy at large. These Jedi spoke to balance within the mind as well as the body and with Force abilities. And today we will discuss one of the most sacred Force powers that the ancient Jedi Order practiced, one that has been lost to the ancient pages of the Order and is no longer practiced. Today we will be discussing the ancient Force abilities known as Alchaka. Alchaka was a meditation ceremony that was extremely rigorous. Alchaka was a very individualized experiment and was all about discovering who you are using the Force, stripping yourself down only to the Force. During the meditation, they would become dizzy and twist and turn, exhausting their mortal bodies, again connecting themselves only to the power of the Force and feeling their true being. A more common term of this was known as movement.
improving meditation, but Alchaka was considered the best that this force ability could offer. One often received insight on exactly what their purpose was and who they were, as well as got the unadulterated opinion of the force. Again, the practice was extremely personal, and for Jedi that were lost, they would often perform this meditation to seek guidance from the force. And although it was seldom practiced by more modern Jedi, Jedi such as Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi had learned of this from ancient texts. This marks itself as one of the most ancient force abilities, and one of the prized force abilities of Jedi Masters, as Jedi Knights and Jedi Padawans were far too weak to perform it properly, far too prideful to perform it properly, as Al Chaka revolved around removing yourself entirely from your pride, goals, and everything to understand your true purpose and potential, therefore making it one of the rare force abilities that a Sith Lord or Dark Side wielder was incapable of using, as of course the goal of a Dark Sider is to obtain power and if you want to obtain power, you will never create the ritual properly. But that is all the information we have on the ancient Jedi force ability known as Al Chaka, and why it was so precious to the Jedi. So as always my friends, thank you guys so much for watching, may the force be with you, and have a great day. Saber, a weapon widely affiliated with the Jedi and the Sith, used by both orders for thousands of years, a tool proudly displayed by both groups, and for two cultures that share so many differences, they both have great respect and pride for their lightsabers. The Jedi use their lightsabers to protect and serve the innocent, only using them for the purpose of defense, while the Sith used it as a tool to spread death and to conquer. But there was a time before lightsabers, when the Jedi and Sith wielded weapons quite different than they do now. Today, we will explore the weapons used by the ancient Force Space Orders before the widespread use of the Jedi and Sith. In the days even before the Republic was established, Jedi and Sith used weapons that can be found in our real world today. Many Jedi Knights chose to wield swords in combat, and others who considered themselves pacifists would carry staffs. But these were not regular weapons like in the realm of reality. These weapons contained special spiritual modifications that made them extremely powerful within the Force. The Jedi and Sith put these weapons through a process that made them extremely durable and far more more dangerous than the original material warranted, as they literally became bound through the Force with the one that had created it. The Jedi did this by imbuing the Force itself into their weaponry, strengthening them. This Force ability was known as Force Weapon. This process is quite similar to how Jedi or Sith find their kyber crystals and imbue their essence into them. However, instead of only a crystal, this ability requires the entire weapon. In Legends, this process can be traced all the way back to the very first Jedi. As the lightsaber was not yet around, the Jedi usually imbued their power into staffs or later swords as the first Jedi were not violent. This imbuing of the weapon was still used in some lightsabers beyond even the crystal, a great example of this would be the Dark Jedi Starkiller. Not only did Starkiller give his essence to the crystal inside his lightsaber, but the saber itself, including the entire hilt and all of the inner workings of the weapon. This skill of thinking outside of the box allowed Starkiller to channel force-based attacks through the lightsaber itself, as he learned how to emit force lightning out of the blade. Starkiller created this deep bond with his entire weapon, and because of it, he actually learned how to use force-based attacks from his lightsaber. In the days of the ancient Jedi Order, Padawans were told to select a material in which to craft their weapon. They then for hours were to craft and mold their weapon until it was unique only to them. They were to let the force guide them until what they created belonged to them in body as well as spirit. Although constructed out of regular materials, because of the strong presence of the Force, these weapons, usually swords, would glow with the power of the Force after the process was complete. The stronger the connection to the light, the stronger the glow. The stronger the connection to the darkness, the area around the blades would become dark and bleak, in some cases even appearing red with the heat of the dark side. Across the stars, the ancient Sith Empire developed weapons of their own. 
the Sith II constructed blades which they called Sith Swords or Sith War Blades. While very similar to the blades of the Jedi in many respects, they did have several key differences. A Sith Sword is enhanced by submerging it in a trough of blood spilled in anger. Grinding its edge with Fulton Rhylite will ensure it never dulls. Originally crafted just like the Jedi's weapons with the Sith's own energy imbued into it, the Sith would then take the next step using Sith alchemy and dark side magic to corrupt the blade further. Using Sith alchemy was a dangerous power that allowed the dark side to physically alter things with its intense power. Because of this, the weapon was extremely difficult to use due to its dark and often uncontrolled nature, but with this came a huge advantage. The Sith blades were every bit as durable and powerful as a regular lightsaber perhaps even more so. The swords could take near endless strikes from a lightsaber and also deflect blaster fire. Ancient Sith had been known to take their blades a step further, similar to how Starkiller would years later, learning to manipulate the force with their blades to the point where they could, if they so desired, emit force lightning and force energies out of them. Because of the dark side being extremely prevalent in the blades, they would emit a glow and dark aura very similar to the force blades of the Jedi Order. Even after the introduction of the lightsaber, many dark lords still chose to use Sith swords, as they found them to be slightly more powerful and enjoyed their more brutal nature of killing. Similar to this, some ancient Jedi still believed their force imbued weapons were better suited for them. The best example being Bodo Sias Boss, who believed his staff was better suited for him due to his pacifist nature, and staff even contended with the blade work of Exar Kun when Master dueled Apprentice long ago. Through the force, I can make my simple staff more powerful than any lightsaber. After the force imbued blades came the force sabers which were weapons very susceptible to the dark side of the force. This weapon was known as a force saber. Force sabers were used by the Rakata Empire, and similar to the lightsaber, utilized crystals as a power source. However, the weapon required the dark side to be present and powerful, as the energy is what formed the actual blade. In the ancient Jedi Order, one Jedi received a vision of a sword made of flame and darkness, and was banished from the Order due to him losing balance. The Jedi would later discover what this Jedi saw was a force saber, and found the weapon far more practical and powerful than the force blades, as the blade of the weapon was energy based and more durable. Although the Jedi Order forbade the use of the weapon, they did realize its superiority to their blades and thus selected a few members to study it intently. After years of research, what eventually was constructed was one of the very first lightsabers. What resulted was a proto saber, which took the crystal principle from the force saber but used crystals that a force user imbued their own nature into. What this meant is it did not require the dark side of the force in order to function. The major drawback for this weapon, however, was it required a constant power source, and thus the users were forced to carry around a battery pack on their belt in order to provide a constant flow of power to the blade. However, this was eventually improved upon itself, and what resulted was the lightsaber we know today. But those were the weapons that both the Jedi and Sith Order used before the creation of the lightsaber. So let me know in the comments down below, out of all of these, what is your favorite non-lightsaber Star Wars weapon? May the Force be with you, and have a great day. Darth Nihilus was what is referred to as a wound in the Force, which is a phenomenon which occurs when there is a terrible large-scale tragedy that occurs. For example, in A New Hope, Obi-Wan actually senses a wound in the Force when Alderaan is destroyed by the Death Star and can literally feel the Force change around him. I felt a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. I fear something terrible has happened. Nihilus though was strange because he was a sentient wound in the force that was in fact the Dark Lord of the Sith simultaneously. Because of this, he spoke and acted very differently as his only true desire in life was to feed off of the force energies of others in an attempt to quench his endless force hunger. He is a wound in the force, more presence than flesh, and in his wake, life dies, sacrificing itself to his hunger. 
Because of his state between life and death, many speculated that this is where he drew his power from, as he held a strong and pure connection to the dark side of the Force. Over time, Nihilus's very body began to fade away due to the overexposure to Force energies. Nihilus was a Dark Lord that walked on the plane of the Force as well as the physical plane at the same time. Because of this, he was almost more entity than he was man. After the final defeat of Nihilus, there were still many that were fascinated by a creature so connected and a part of the dark side of the Force, as the Jedi Order desired to study these strange Force phenomenons and examine the history of Darth Nihilus. Long after his eventual demise, Nihilus was still extraordinarily famous, especially among the Jedi Order. Through various ancient Sith holocrons, the Jedi Order located locations where they could sample the voice of Darth Nihilus and attempted to explain why it was so different and why it was altered so much after he became a wound in the Force. This is what many Jedi scientists and scholars said concerning their theories of the voice of Darth Nihilus. Nihilus wore a mask of possible Hindaian origin and spoke an unsettling, literally extirpating tongue. Jedi seers sampling it from a Sith holocron proclaimed its intelligibility required mere patience. Nihilus's was the language spoken billions of years hence, at the end of all time. Jedi mystics offered a slightly less fantastical hypothesis, and possibly Nihilus spoke the raw dialect of the Force itself, a language untranslated by midichlorians. One needed only to die to comprehend it. It is interesting here that the Jedi speculate that the voice of Nihilus may literally be the language of the Force itself, as he is a man that walks between both planes of existence as a wound in the Force. But that is why the Jedi Order opted to study the voice of the ancient Sith Lord Darth Nihilus, and what they determined about it long after Nihilus's final defeat. But what are your thoughts on this language, and what theory do you subscribe to posed by the Jedi Order? Does Nihilus speak the language of the end of time, or does he speak the literal dialect of the Force itself? I would love to hear what you guys have to say about this in the comments down below. You guys, as always, so much for watching. Your viewership means the world to me. May the Force be with you, and have a great day. The Jedi Grandmaster has always been an integral part of the overall structure of the Jedi Order. The rank and title of the Grandmaster was reserved exclusively for the wisest, and often most powerful member of the Order at the time. Due to the status of this position, every Grand Master in Jedi history has influenced the Jedi Order as well as the galaxy as a result in their own unique way, and often by proxy, influenced the very trajectory of the galaxy. The other day, we did a video on Master Fake Coven, the one that was just before Grand Master Yoda. But today, we want to explore the Jedi Temple Archives, and take an even deeper dive than that. Welcome, curious acolytes of the galaxy, to today's Holoved, where we will be dusting off the ancient scrolls and holocrons in order to discover who is the very first Jedi Grand Master. In order to trace the Grand Master, we must first start from the bottom up going all the way back to the history of the position of the Grand Master itself. This will take us back to the year 36,019 BBY, or before the Battle of Yavin. Of course, it all starts with the Ancient Jedi Order. If you saw our video detailing the history of the Jedi, you will be familiar of where we will begin. Back in the days, eight strange pyramid-shaped ships, which were called the Thoyor, called out to all four sensitive beings in the galaxy and settled down on specific planets in order to congregate them. Once these ships were all loaded up with Force Sensitives, the Sips all convened to the world of Tython, where some of the ships embedded themselves into the very ground itself, while others remained in the skies. Soon after, the Force Sensitives learned their purpose, which was to study the Force in its many mysteries and discover its true nature. The largest of the Thoyor ships was made into the first Jedi Temple, and as the Jedi Pilgrims branched out and explored Tython more, they established temples all over the planet. It is important to note that back in the day, there was no singular Grand Master of the wider order. Each temple had its own Temple Master, and every once in a while, these Temple Masters would come together to form the Council of the Masters, which is a precursor to the Jedi High Council, but without a Grand Master overall. For the purposes of this video, we won't get into each and every temple and their Masters, but if you'd like to know more about the Jedi Order and how they differed from the Jedi we know now, we highly recommend checking out our video on that topic in The First Jedi. If you wanted to get technical, the first ever Grand Master would have been the Master of the First Temple. Before the explorers branched out on Tython, 
Padawan Kresh was the first temple that was established on Tython, which was a training academy for the Jedi, and the temple master that oversaw this was named Nordia Gra. There is currently unfortunately no information about Nordia beyond a quote of hers, and the record of the position, the position that she held as the first ever temple master. So unfortunately, there's not much to cover here. But what if we look a little later in the timeline? Earlier, we put the term Grandmaster in quotes because even though they were the first, that doesn't make them the official Jedi Grandmaster, as that was undermined by the later formation of the Master's Council. Again, in this time, there was no Master that oversaw at all. In fact, the first records of a Jedi Grandmaster wouldn't be seen until nearly 10,000 BBY. The first Jedi Grand Master, though, was allegedly a human male named Biel Doctaves, with Doctaves being the earliest recording of a Grand Master that we can find within the archives. Doctaves lived on the planet of Osis, the second great Jedi world, which places him as Grand Master sometime after the first great schism, but nearly 2,000 years before the second great schism, which was the formation of the Sith Empire formally. Grandmaster Doctaves lived during what is known as the Pius Deu Crusades. These crusades were a series of conflicts that lasted nearly a thousand years. They were started by a human-centric religious sect that had violent, militaristic tendencies, unfortunately getting one of their own to become appointed as Supreme Chancellor, who then launched the campaign. Having neutralized the unpopular Huts, the sect unleashed a series of military crusades and inquisitions against rival alien sects over the following centuries, gaining more and more power. Every term, the Supreme Chancellor would be replaced with another of the Pius Dei, who would in turn take the same name and would continue the series of wars, which harshly spit the humans of the core worlds and the alien species of the Outer Rim, creating one of the most contentious times in galactic history. This continued all the way into the 19th consecutive Chancellor. This was finally put to an end when the Jedi got involved and conspired alongside a group of peacekeepers to cause a rift with the Pius Deu, which soon ultimately toppled their rule, finally arresting the Chancellor, trying him, and imprisoning him for his crimes. Following this, the Jedi High Council installed Doctaves in the office of Supreme Chancellor, Grandmaster Doctaves also served as the Grandmaster of the Order at the same time, leading both the Republic and the Jedi Order in unison, and creating a long line of Jedi being the Chancellors of the Republic. We would call this an incredibly interesting turn of events, as this is the first and one of the only times that the Jedi Order got so heavily involved in the Galactic Senate, with a Jedi Master serving as both Grandmaster as well as Supreme Chancellor. The galaxy was truly under full control of the Jedi at this point in time. The idea that a Jedi should hold a seat in the Senate, much less the seat of a Chancellor, feels like a widely foreign concept, and could possibly be attributed to why the modern Jedi refuse any seat in the Senate. Though it could also have something to do with the rise of the Sith. When the Jedi and the Sith began going to war, there were many who saw this as nothing more than a religious war between the Jedi and Sith that the wider galaxy was ultimately suffering for which then is likely what kept any Jedi from being allowed a seat on the Republic Senate. It is also worth mentioning though that the Republic itself didn't actually get involved with the Sith Empire until the Dark Lord Naga Sadao baited them all into going to war with one another. Unfortunately, like many of these ancient Jedi, there isn't much info regarding Doctave's power in the Force nor his skill with the lightsaber. However, we can say and can deduce that he must have been a brilliant tactician as he worked alongside the Kamis peacekeepers to engineer a divide in the Pius Deo religion, and then he led a final strike against the Pius when they were weakened by their own civil war. The final confrontation between the two sects was a naval battle in which Doctaves had gained the secret help from the Bureau of Ships and Services, who he had instructed to implant a code within the Pius fleet. When the time of the battle came, the Bureau activated the Beacon Code, which sent nearly half of the enemy fleet jumping off to a completely random and distant plane of hyperspace. From here, victory was swift, and Doctavis led a team of Jedi Knights to storm the flagship and capture the enemy once and for all. So friends, what do you think of the first ever Jedi Grandmaster, Biel Doctavis? What do you think of the Republic, and what do you think it was like under the Chancellorship of a Jedi Grandmaster? Leave your thoughts in the comments down below, and let us know what other topics would you like to see covered in future videos. And as always, my Jedi and Sith friends alike, may the Force be with you 
and have a great day. The Jedi Order is one dedicated to maintaining peace throughout the galaxy, but sometimes some of the most terrifying and horrendous deeds are ones committed with hope of peace. The Jedi are a far from perfect order, and while they may appear as the righteous moral compass of those that reside in the galaxy, they too have committed terrible acts. One of the greatest weapons of the Sith is fear. It's an emotion that is difficult to destroy. In the days of the ancient Jedi, a talented former Jedi Knight fell to the dark side, corrupted by Sith spirits of dark lords that had long since passed. This boy, falling under the ways of power over peace, waged war against the Jedi, slaying his own master in single combat and killing hundreds of Jedi Knights over the war. The reign of this dark lord, although brief, would scar and alter the Jedi Order for centuries to follow. This Dark Lord's name was Exar Kun. Although he was ultimately defeated by the Jedi, the power of Kun struck the Jedi with an emotion the Order preaches to avoid, that of fear. Perhaps the most fearful and scarred of all the Jedi was the Jedi Master that had lost the most during the war with Exar. Not only did she lose her husband, Barristan, but Kun also killed her master in single combat, despite pleas to return to the light. This Jedi Master's name was Krinda Dre. Although becoming more distant from the Jedi Order following the war, Krinda's son Lucian was trained in the Jedi ways, and Krinda also trained another Force-sensitive due to her rare ability of foresight, which Krinda shared. This ability is one that allowed a practitioner to glimpse into the past, or the future, similar to the dreams that Anakin Skywalker would experience later in the timeline. Krinda trained her student as a Jedi Seer, also gathering other similarly gifted Jedi, in large part due to a premonition Krinda received that indicated that there was a group of Jedi among them capable of foiling any future plan of the returned Sith. This group that Krinda formed was known as the Jedi Covenant, and was only spoken of in the dark sections of the Jedi Temple. This group of Jedi also trained other Padawans of their own, and after some years passed, they approached the rank of Knight. As a final test for these students, the Jedi Padawans had to venture on their own to a planetoid known as the Rogue Moon, where the Force was extremely powerful. While awaiting the arrival of their students, the Jedi Covenant meditated and tapped into the Force due to it being very powerful. Not expecting anything significant, the Jedi were flooded with visions of fire and death as they saw the brutal murders of each member of the group. The Covenant also witnessed the entirety of the Jedi Order as well as the Republic burned to the ground. Each vision, although varied, shared one commonality. Each death that the Jedi saw was conducted by a dark figure in a crimson cloak. It's what we've been watching for, the Sith. The Sith are returning, in flames Lucian, the Order, the Republic, all in flames. The Jedi were naturally completely shocked, as their Padawans had all been gifted crimson cloaks for their mission to the Rogue Moon. Seeing this as a sign, the Covenant was drenched in fear. As the Jedi Padawans arrived from their trials, the Covenant became reclusive, meeting for hours and then days, deliberating the fate of the students. Krinda Dre, although hardened, refused to kill the students, citing she had already seen too much death. Her son Lucian, however, disagreed and made arrangements still for the Padawans to be executed, not wanting to lose his mother or the Jedi Order as an entirety. Lucian developed a cover story that explained one of the Jedi Padawans, after learning they failed their knighthood, would kill the other remaining students, and left with no choice, the Masters would execute him. With all preparations in place, the Covenant prepared to do what was necessary. The banquet commenced, and as the night moved on, the Jedi Masters prepared to do what was required for them for the Republic. When the time came, however, not all went according to plan. Although the Jedi successfully killed four of the Padawans, the Jedi Padawan to Lucian, named Zane, escaped the massacre, and after a lengthy foot chase, evaded the Jedi Masters. The Jedi Covenant now began to panic, as they believed now not only would the Sith return in the form of Zane, but that they themselves had created the Sith once again, and allowed the way of fear to consume them. Zane would later be blamed for the murders of the Jedi Padawans, and not only the Jedi, but all of the Republic was placed on high alert for his capture. Zane, however, would not give up that easily, resolving to clear his name of all wrongdoing and expose the Jedi Covenant for their crime. Eventually it was revealed the Sith would return, and would stem from the Jedi, but that it was not Zane who would be the source. Lucian's own master and failed Jedi, Hazen, revealed himself as a Sith Acolyte after taking control of the Jedi Covenant from within. Partially, the vision the Covenant experienced would come to pass, as both directly and indirectly, Hazen killed the members of the Covenant, with the exception of Lucian, who with the help of Zane, banded together to defeat Hazen. 